Thank you.
the word lohar chol has been mentioned already uh, and i want to tell you a little bit about lohar chol uh, basically uh, if you take the 83 limited bus and get off at metro and walk down as though you're going towards princess street you have to cut through the court of small causes go a little bit further and then you find a series of shops um, basically selling someone is taking electrical goods um, Lohar Chol uh, is a, a bazaar uh, in the in the classical colonial sense of the term, and it goes back a really long way. It has sold a number of goods over over a number of years. Uh, it's next to a number of markets, all of which are collectively known as Princess Street, which is probably uh, not exactly right. Um, but if you go down there and if you turn right and go through an alley, which is a word that we will come to more often. And you, there's a, there's, there used to be a there used to be a a, a wooden th a metal thing that that was kept up there to prevent the building from falling down. Right in the middle of the of the of the staircase, if you went round it, you had to be thin to do it, which I was in those days. Um, and get the three floors, you found a studio of an yeah, artist. Four stories. Four stories. <laughs> you found a studio of an artist which spoke not at all. It appeared at face value to what was around it. Uh, in what way was the art that was being made connected at all to the bazaar, to the, you know, I mean, that, that, that experience that you have in Bombay that you, know, you could actually put your, put your ear to the ground and you could hear the hum of capital. That particular place is known as, as Lohar Chol. Um, we will say a little bit about Lohar Chol as we go. I think it's already been mentioned once and you'll find it repeated uh, in, in a number of the uh, works that you have here. Um, but I just want to start with a prefatory proposition, and that is that Nalini is, as I understand it, staged her work over the last year in this, in this space. And I think there are two ways in which an artist stages her work. One way is to look at it in terms of stages, right? I mean, one stage follows another stage. And the assumption is that the second stage is some kind of a progression over the previous one. You've, you've, you've sort of progressed, you've moved from one stage to another. And then there is a way by which the next stage will require us as we investigate how it came to be, what was there in the previous stage that, 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 that suggested the change that, that would then take place? I mean, what was there that, that made the next stage happen? And then there's another way of staging, right? This is how an artist stages their work, literally as though on a stage. You know, you, you, you stage it, you, to use another, another uh, term from art practice, you frame it so as to, to get it to make a certain kind of meaning, right? The, that particular idea of staging. And in this, uh, in this period that we're going to now talk about, which is defined by Lohar Chol, I have suggested that we do it like this, uh, this conversation. I am uh, staging the work uh, in a way that probably talks to, hopefully will talk to the way the work has been staged at the KNMA over the last several months um, <coughs> in three in three parts. Uh, the first part I am going to call Lohar Chol. Um, and I have decided that I'm going to actually um, put together a body of work which I think signifies what I understand of those stages. It's not the most important work she made then. It is not the most you know, definitive work of the time. It's simply what I see as indicative of that work. Uh, the first stage I'm going to call Lohar Chol. The second stage I'm going to call the glitch. Uh, <laughs> you have, uh, you have uh, um, various uh, glitches that, that arise. And the third uh, I'm going to call memory record erase. Now, this is actually not within the historical circumstance, but if you go back to 1992, which is when Nalini looked like this, uh, and she was at, the, at this point of time actually painting the, the exhibition that would be uh, the City of Desire's work, that would be the video work that, that we saw. Uh, and two things happened. One uh, needs no introduction. 1992 is a year very, very, very well known in Bombay. Um, I, don't, I, I just have to say Bombay 1992 and you know what I'm talking about. The second is a bunch of words that we came across. One was a word called mylar. Okay? I never heard of mylar before and I don't think I've heard of it since actually. 
<laughs> the only time I ever heard of that word is with, with Nalini. Mylar and plastic. The second, reverse painting, that is to say painting in the opposite way. Uh, glass painting would be the most obvious, but it would be a series of subsequent painting experiments that would be there. The third, stop motion photography. On the left you have, uh, I think it's called Alleyway, Loha, Alleyway, Alleyway of Lohar. Alleyway of Lohar. Told the very first installation work Nalini ever did. Uh, I was in some marginal way involved in that particular exhibition. It's called City of Desires. Um, and you have the plastic there. You have the translucent works through which um, the light passes. And you actually went into the work yeah. for the very first time. On the right-hand side, you have the actual uh, display of the... Um, City of Desires exhibition at the Gallery Kemol, which would be part of the film, the video that you have in this in this show. And those thingies that you see there are mylar. Um, I have two questions, really speaking. One is, why do artists change their mediums? I mean, this was dramatic. Uh, it wasn't as dramatic in 1992 as we would see in hindsight. It's not something that something that one would have thought would have led to the kind of change that now Nalini would, would show. Uh, the very following year, literally, Nalini Malani did Medea. Uh, and, and, and that was, that was you know, I mean, it, it was not possible to, in hindsight, I think, envisage that Medea would emerge from this set of changes that were now in, in, in place. So the first question is, why do artists change their mediums? And secondly, would they be, in your view, any change, any any way in which look at these kinds of changes? I mean, you know, basic technical changes and how an artist works with the big changes that were taking place in Bombay. Lohar Chol was not going to be Lohar Chol anymore. Bombay was not going to be Bombay anymore. Well, <clears throat> um, I think often the exigency of the socio-political situation demands a certain kind of change. And um, I don't think it was very conscious um, there was a kind of an anxiety uh, that might have brought that change. Um, the other thing that happened was that when I uh, moved to the studio at uh, Loharchal, I had to, on the streets, I had to avert my gaze because I was walking through people's homes, homes without walls, homes nonetheless, because there was everyday life going on, a quotidian existence of you know, waking in the morning, dressing, uh, putting the children to school, etc. But these were all pavement dwellers. And for me, uh, the hierarchy of the street was what I wanted to bring into my artworks. But how to do that uh, without a sense of a voyeurism, without actually standing on the street and sketching as we used to do in the art school, without using a camera to record what was out there on the street. So what I used something that we all have, memory. So for me to memorize the fall of the figure, the kind of uh, relationship that exists in between people on the street, and bring it back to my studio, and then with a loaded brush, I mean almost like a 20 uh, sable brush, uh, put in the figure all at once so that I would get the fall of the figure. When you draw in time, you tend mm -hmm. to forget the fall of the figure. But when you're doing it all at once, uh, you're able to achieve something of that look. So it all started like that. And then um, Mylar, I, the, the transparent support uh, came about because um, I wanted uh, on uh, 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 to... Uh, have the stain uh, right there. I didn't want it to be absorbed. I wanted to be there visceral. That was the only visceral part, the, 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 the glutinous part of that color, the mucousness almost, with, because I would mix it with uh, gum arabic. So there it was floating, you know. Mm -hmm. So like a little bit of pro, I, I just wanted to have light there, you know. So therefore I started to use these transparent supports. And then it got extended into many other spheres of my work. Mm -hmm. So that's how it started. Memory and the stress of recall. This for me has been the kind of a chant in my head for a long time. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, there's a there's a part of this which can, you know, I mean, all artists, I imagine, in some form or the other, are guilt-ridden by the fact that they are separated from the world. You know, that their very practice isolates them. That it's, so, you know, that you have to get the world into your into your art. Uh, there's a certain, you might say, a realist way in which that problem is addressed by literally going into the streets and 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 sketching, yeah. painting, photographing, or whatever. Here, it almost seems as though you inverted the relationship, not by not by bringing the street into your studio, but, but literally by uh, almost as it were converting a form of individuated bodily selfhood as the site upon which that reality would play out. And this would happen, I mean, it's astonishing for me to think that 1992 City, for Desires, City of Desires in 1993 is Medea. Yeah. Just the following year. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. In, in Medea, uh, a number of the iconographies that we will then see um, arising, which actually I think come all the way through to the, the work that we just looked at. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. The glitch <laughs> is here. Uh, the bombs are here. The, 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 the entire idea of a viscerally formed feminine selfhood upon which the world is written, yeah. that would be something that I would today read back in the City of Desires. Right. What do you think? Wow. <laughs> well, I accept if you say so. <laughs> yeah, no, no, there were many other reasons also for making City of Desires. It was again, you know, the thing is I have, um, I only have my experience and I only have my materials and I only have my whatever skills I might have. But with these things, I try to um, to put out there um, things that worry me and uh, with a great deal of anxiety. I mean, that uh, uh, going to the Akhara and Nathadwara, I mean, it just blew me over that people were just not doing anything about it mm -hmm. and the way the press codes were just allowed to just go into rack and ruin. Mm -hmm. And that's why I did The City of Desires. But of course, it was my subject, Lord Chal, that I wanted to paint, mm -hmm. not Ras Leela and things of that nature. So whenever there has been a thing that has bothered me a lot, I just have to come with my own tools mm -hmm. to uh, to work with it. As also then happened Medea. We'll come to Medea in a, in a little bit. I understand that Medea has been very adequately yes. Yes. Uh, yes. displayed here, but it it uh, what can I say? It hit Bombay uh, with all the all the power of a of a of a, of a bolt of lightning or something. Um, I don't think Bombay had seen anything like it. The Bombay art scene had seen anything even remotely uh, of that kind. I don't think that the performances that that, that we saw of Alaknanda Samar in in relationship to the the, the, the paintings themselves, right. which were which are available here, uh, and the capacity that you had to see from the street, something that I think you saw very much more recently in Delhi in the APJ shows, and yeah, then yeah. the exhibition That's actually right. spilled over into the street. This was something that was completely new. Uh, yeah. at that time. Yes, we, um, well, the place where we had the uh, performance had these uh, big French windows right yeah. uh, on the street. And if you remember, we started the performance on the street with uh, motorcycles going round and round around the audience. And then the actress beckons the audience in. And we had three spaces that she took us through. Yeah. So it was... Um, no, it was an amazing experience because first of all, we also didn't have a theatre director. It was more in the nature of a jugalbandi, where I would provide the environment and she would perform in it, re react with it, and sometimes even try to destroy it. Mm. The, I mean, I, I really want to just go back here and we'll, we'll just spend another minute on this because I think right. it's really interesting. Uh, the watercolours. Yeah. Right? In, in a sense, the first time I met Talini was shortly after the Place of People exhibition had happened in the famous His Life series. Yeah. And a series of very, very well-known oil paintings were uh, were on display there. And shortly thereafter, Nalini did something that I thought was completely strange. She practically abandoned oil painting for a period of time uh, in order to do watercolors that were sold for seven hundred rupees uh, at the at the Pandoran Art Gallery. I, I actually bought one because um, I could afford it <laughs> in 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 those days. And the one the, the work that I actually have has got this enormous giant woman. It's called the Dream, yeah. uh, and it's this this, this gigantic figure uh, on a 
well, on a situation in which people are uh, defecating and you know, all sorts of other activities are happening all around the gigantic figure of this particular blue woman, in a sense, Medea is anticipated in oh, some of this okay. work. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Yes, well. Uh, so you, I mean, you're really looking at a situation in which, perhaps unbeknownst to yourself, you're doing things personally, right. and major political developments are happening all around you in yeah. Bombay, yeah. which would, in a sense, coincide in 1992. Right. right. <laughs> yes, um, uh, well, the watercolors, um, I was at an impasse with uh, oil colors, and of course, the whole history of oil, color, oil painting in India, and uh, the kind of... Um, work that we had been uh, assigned at art schools, etc. At some point, uh, there was in uh, Bombay the feeling that if you were not making oils, you were not really making art at all. <laughs> and also the thing is that uh, uh, very much after that, when I was doing so many other uh, things with the Mylar, etc., uh, one or two people would say, well, when are you going to stop experimenting and when are you going to make art? So you know, I'd rather like that. So anyway, so then I, I, I felt that uh, oil painting couldn't give me uh, the kind of fluidity. I mean, the kind of uh, the mucus, let's say, the, the protoplasm that I could, uh, with, I, with, with which I could uh, move my lexicon of, uh, uh, you know, the lexicon, the language forward. And of course, took place an exhibition. Uh, so Nilima Sheikh is here, and uh, Arpita is here. But uh, uh, Nilima Sheikh, Arpita Singh, uh, uh, Madhvi Parekh, and Nalini did this exhibition, which was actually women artists explicitly not talking oil painting. Right. right. I mean, trying yeah. to sort of yeah. work with yeah. another kind of medium. Would you want to? Yes. Well, I, you know, I, I think it was an important, definitive exhibition. It was a very definitive exhibition, and I think that uh, um, I have to say that. Uh, we, as a group of uh, artists together, had uh, the maximum amount of exhibitions compared to any other group that has taken place so far in India. And we had, uh, I think, five exhibitions together, uh, carrying our babies and our hips on, in the trains, and uh, from Bombay to Bangalore to Delhi twice. And uh, it started in Bhopal with the uh, fantastic support of uh, Swaminathan. Uh, Arpita was able to get us even a catalog from uh, uh, Bharat Bhavan. So uh, for us, this is great. And uh, the fact that we could actually be our own audience. I think I learned a lot in that exhibition from, uh, from each one of the artists in the show because we were minding our own show. It was not in a gallery. So we'd be taken care of and we were looking, we were looking at our works through the day. And then things would start revealing themselves to us. And this was a very, very important uh, learning curve, at least mm. for me. Mm. Move on a bit. I'll give you a minute to look at this. The hieroglyph uh, series, I think, is actually in this particular exhibition. On the right, uh, the third of the three stands that you can see Um, the third of the three changes that I wanted to talk to talk about, especially because I think that, that especially interests me, um, the stop motion uh, work. You know, this is literally you could actually watch and you will see uh, the paint drop, the paint fall uh, on 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 the work. Um, three works, Nalini. Uh, four actually, if you include the job, but. Uh, Hamlet machine, media material, Toba takes in. Uh, and, and, and absolutely extraordinary sort of trilogy of, of uh, works, which uh, I think, I think you know, I mean, through the 1990s, you were changing almost year by year as an artist. <laughs> I mean, 1992, you had City of Design, 1993, Hamlet machine, 1996, you did memory, record erase, 1998, you did. Uh, uh, Toba Tek Singh. Uh, 98 I did Toba Tek Singh and also the, the first uh, shadow play. It was, it was an extraordinary decade and I, I just, I just, just one thing I wanted to say and that is something which I actually wrote when I wrote, uh, I wrote a long essay on Nalini um, in uh, following the APJ show and I, I wrote this about it. The connection between layering and digitization, now Nalini was starting to come into digital 
forms, uh, Hamlet machine would be, I think, an absolute example of that. And the glitch in, in, in media material would be the first, I mean, it's pretty digital in a manner of speaking, but that particular sort of nothing space, the vacuous space that took you in and, 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 and sucked you up and made you into, into nothing. Uh, the connection between layering and digitization, the link between new virtualized materials like the video glitch and their connection with the desert of the real, um, this is a phrase that I took of course from the matrix, uh, welcome to the desert of the real, um, the real world, if there is one left, is what makes Nandi Manani's work distinctive. This is what I wrote in the in the third text thing. Now, here's a situation where you're no longer realist. You're not looking at Bombay and saying, well, this is the world that I have to get into my heart. The city itself has actually become a bombed out science fiction uh, desert, as it were. And that particular structure of now a space which is a stage, which is no longer a stage of Loha Chol, but, but, but a very different kind of any place, metropolitan India, metropolitan world, uh, would be something that you would you would now straddle with yeah. this extraordinary I think try war work basically. So what you've seen Hamlet Machine and uh, um, and uh, uh, media. Um, uh, this gives me a new angle about the glitch. Um, the glitch it started uh, in the dear material in ninety three where I wanted uh, it to be like the Berlin Wall. And actually, when she performs next to the glitch, she actually fondles it almost as if it is this wall, which had, of course, come down by then. It was 89 when the wall came down. And in a sense, it also marks, uh, it's a historical moment, because not only did things change in Europe, which they did in a very, uh, dramatic way, but I think that all of us uh, have uh, experienced the uh, aftermath uh, of the fall of the Berlin Wall in the sense that uh, anything to do with leftism, anything to do with socialism was not at all being considered anymore post-89. And for me, that was a great loss. Uh, it was, in a sense, the essence of life which uh, leftist ideas gave, which made the human being have its, his or her dignity, to see the dignity in poverty, for example, which is what Lohar Chal gave me, because these were not people who were begging, they were people very gainfully employed. The dignity in poverty, that became a real problem, because poverty was considered almost criminal post the wall. And all of these things then led to these ideas. And I think the glitch, now that you pointed out to me, is that every now and again, everything just sort of disintegrates. It just completely falls apart. And even in this building, this huge Scottish National Gallery, when the glitch ran over this entire facade of 80 meters, it was not there anymore. You know, uh, and that was what would happen if, if, uh, uh, wars continued. I mean, I mean to go to the extreme. Um, and uh, nine, eight, 92, 93, what we experienced in Bombay was such a fear. Because I remember you, you, we couldn't contact you. <laughs> you, you even near the passport office where there had been a, a, a strike. Uh, and for the, for the whole day, there was no Ashish. And you can imagine the kind of anxiety <laughs> Uh, for all of us. So anyway, so that's the, the person. person yeah. The person we couldn't contact, uh, they, they really terrified us was Rumana. Uh, oh, she was the person God, she went yes. missing for yeah, <laughs> also. a yeah. number of yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, a number of days. And then came another term in Nalini's work, another another word which I think has come again and again, mutant. Yeah. Um, what is a mutant? Uh, oh. This is a term that I think she got from a text which I think she has long exhausted. I think that is an important text. It's called Global Parasites, uh, written by um, Winnin Pereira. Pereira. Uh, well, I suppose a historian, really, of, uh, of science. And it, it, it's not, it's not an, I'm not saying it's not an important book, but what you've done with it and where you've taken it is, is extraordinary. And you had this entire series of mutants yeah. who yeah. were 
if you like products of this bombed out world you know that when when civilization you know reaches this particular point and you get these extraordinary creatures that yeah. are created by uh, the atomic yeah. uh, explosions yeah. that that you talked about you get you get you yeah. get creatures of this kind and yeah. that seems something that your work is consistently yeah. dealt yeah. with well, yeah. the interest that you also had in myths i mean so medea was one cassandra is now yeah. one yeah. but even if you look at the, the the woman in the job as almost a figure of a myth these are these are bitter myths right. these are brutal myths right aren't they well yeah um i think that uh, um it's i suppose it's a plea to f- feminize the world you know mm-hmm. in one sense because i think we are going so much towards masculinity and the, and the, and the male principle that uh, i think that the balance has been uh, completely skewed um the fact that even in the clip that you saw the uh, documentary of the work at uh, for lights out uh, that you just saw on the scottish national gallery i particularly chose to have women uh, the the clip of the women making bombs for world war 1 and you might wonder why i chose that the very fact that that was the moment when a lot of uh, women became sort of free because it was the war that made them free and that was the paradox and irony that finally they were making the bombs that were going to kill human beings and so, um, all throughout uh, discoveries and inventions that are meant to cause uh, life to be uh, uh, more comfortable in fact have the undertow of destruction and this i think is something that i've been wanting to address throughout that period and the mutants came about especially when uh, in the in the medea story she's pushed in a, into a situation where the betrayal is so enormous that she has to say that these children are not mine i'm she's degendered therefore the line that i had around the robe was i know man or woman split mankind apart into two and live in the empty middle to for someone to have said that it means these these children are his and therefore i have i, I will not i i i cut them off completely as also in sita the moment uh, she has to go through the second trial she decides to go back into the earth into her mother's womb and leaves the children without the mother and she ag- again becomes degendered she's not a mother anymore so these are things that you know after all uh, when there is a war it's an oligarchy of men who decide this uh, and then finally what's left is the wounded and the and 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 children who are you know without arms and legs and uh, you know it's the women who have to take care after they are the, the they are the residual force so all of these things and after all women give birth <laughs> and it translates into a condition of materiality doesn't it i mean you know something that constitutes i mean one of the things i've been very fascinated by and something that i think your work really especially foregrounds is the way that very large phenomena actually translate into the everyday uh, into even the mundane right um, yeah. you know there's well, that, that connection common parlance, so i think we should talk about these things right. all the time yeah. one little uh, aside this is for johan actually a uh, bit of the mundane uh, in relation to this uh, you know johan was telling me you know the the city of desire's work which is at this point of time on display there uh, is a digital reconstruct well a digital restoration of uh, the video that was made at that point of time by yeah. by nalini with with alok and i was actually in some ways involved in trying to some make way, really? okay <laughs> i was involved in a way that made that that helped to make it all happen but there was a real problem there uh, johan was saying that the, the the beta that was there was had so many what they call dropouts um, yeah. because those dropouts were 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 uh, you know making it virtually un- impossible to 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 access so the dropouts themselves actually had a history to them didn't they they were actually part of the of the 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 mud that you were using which which entered the camera which entered the camera so i was actually almost <laughs> wondering as to whether the dropout shouldn't be part of the materiality of the video itself in the okay. way that memory record erases and stains and subsequent yeah. work actually has it i was wondering whether 
you know, because you have to say that they actually found a VHS, which is a good VHS, and it's yeah. there now. Yeah. So you actually have a cleaned up version, but yeah. whether the dropouts <laughs> don't <laughs> curiously enough have... But that would be a whole narrative a that actually... In a way that yeah. only Nalini could, yeah. have, could have brought to it. <laughs> um, we move to, I'll just take another few minutes, the, the last... Stage. This was a time when uh, I slightly uh, lost touch with Dalini, but also a time when you, your your stage was 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 now truly global, right? Yeah. Uh, you were you were exhibiting worldwide. Your yeah. concerns were global, as we see yeah. in the in the Scotland show. You know, you were talking about not even leave alone Lohar Chol or even Bombay. You were not even talking about India. You were actually yeah. talking about global concerns right. and the global is something i'm very fascinated by because you constantly have as you have in the in the in the drawing that uh, nalini has of that wall on the right hand side with the 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 cylinders are something that i believe you just did a couple of days yes, ago right. um this, this woman holding a globe now let me give you a secret about that globe that globe is actually the head of a man <laughs> the way i read it uh, and i believe that earlier you actually had that that uh, neon of this woman holding a man's head and the man was probably Jason, uh, and she must have been uh, must have been Medea. Yeah. Uh, this kind of way in which a woman will hold the globe and say, "Okay, now I'm a global artist." Uh, oh. <laughs> if you like, that <laughs> change, that okay. change. I wanted to ask you about yeah. because because I don't see you necessarily now being limited by um, concerns as mundane as trying to get the people on the street into your art. Uh, I still want more. that, <laughs> but yeah, I still want that. Uh, yes, <laughs> but uh, the thing is that the global no, because you know, uh, I think the concerns are the kind of what globalization has brought about are these concerns. I mean, I think that uh, the period where we were concerned in terms of nationalism have really uh, uh, they are now defunct, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, it's really multinationals and. People uh, in those uh, corporations that are governing so many changes that are taking place uh, on the planet. Yeah. Ecologically, the swathes of land are totally getting destroyed because multinational companies come in and uh, mm -hmm. usurp those areas for uh, exploitation, quarrying, and so on. And we know that the whole middle area of India is under siege. Yes. And, uh, you know, the quarry is uh, the the quarrying of uh, bauxite has left areas completely denuded of forests. And that is already, we're experiencing things like what happened last year in Uttarakhand and now what we see in Srinagar. And these are things, you know, I, I think artists are constantly worried about these things because it's a global situation which is leading to terrible disasters. Mm -hmm. And I think that as, uh, as artists, I think there's a number of people concerned about this and finding ways to put it out there. It's not anymore, you know, just appearing in papers and things. It's really actually happening. It's about time we, we woke up to it. And also coinciding with this period that we're talking about, uh, when you're talking about globalization, you, you, you finally hit upon a, a, a medium, a form, a technology that is now uniquely your own, right. and that is these rotating cylinders. Yes. Uh, you have them on display here, and you actually this is this is version four three. of three of the yeah. rotating cylinders. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the left, uh, turning tables. The tables are turning. Yeah, the tables are turning. Um, yeah. From what I can, I've never, I've never had the opportunity to see the work work in the original. But basically, I think I mean this is what I want to suggest to you yeah. that if in 1992 Mylar uh, reverse painting, you might say. Yeah. Uh, and stop motion, three quite different technologies, right. but you started exploring. This technology brings everything together. Right. In, in the most extraordinary way you can imagine, because it actually brings motion back in, in a way that one right. simply not anticipated, it's almost like the, the video of the drops coming and now you have the effects of movement. Yeah. I mean, can you say something about how you arrived at this, at this form, this technology, something that yeah. is completely and absolutely yours now? Yes, um, it started in quite a different way. Uh, I mean, after uh, experiencing the terrible riots of '93, mm. um, and uh, every now and again uh, there were uh, little things happening, and uh, you know there were things bubbling under the surface. Uh, I wanted to make uh, Buddhist prayer wheels, and uh, the other image you have with the cat, 
that's uh, I, I call that the secret of the profane. It was a shadow play um, where uh, they, the cylinders were turning at four RPM very slowly, and uh, it sort of uh, it was a kind of uh, how shall I say uh, uh, a salve uh, uh, to bring back some kind of sense of peace, you know. Um, but I did a very uh, naughty thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Reverse painting came to India in the 18th century with erotic images. With uh, uh, the Chinese brought these in, and uh, so this was uh, uh, the erotic and the profane. But the artists of the region, like Tanjore, etc., they started to paint sacred images, and uh, these are also very popular pictures. But I wanted to bring back the profanities because I felt that there are certain Indian texts that have erotic things in them. And the powers that be were trying to sanitize, so to speak, the Bhagwat, etc., and remove some of that erotic uh, element. So I had things in it which were about the Bhagwat, which I read in detail. And also at the same time, it had mm. to work like a Buddhist prairie. That's how it started. But it also had other, I mean, when you start working with a certain material, it gives you other directions as well. So uh, the ones that I did for Tables Have Turned, uh, I wanted to, in one sense, evoke a past where we used to have turntables and uh, long playing records. And uh, so those are really actually like turntables on which I have the cylinders. And then together, you see, they tell a story mm -hmm. with all the images and things like that. Um, and in one sense, uh, the stories are such that uh, they evoke uh, 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 a sense of modernism, which comes from the Maya Bridge dog, which you see again in, in Search of Ma Vanished Blood. For me, that kind of uh, observation of nature comes with modernism. And I think the agenda of modern modernism was thwarted in India. We didn't go full swing into it. We started in the Nehruvian era with uh, Corbusier, etc., and the Nehruvian uh, agenda. But somehow, Post-modernism comes in and you know sweeps away mm -hmm. some of the importance of, uh, uh, of modernism. Mm -hmm. So all of these things have played a part in continuing with this uh, form. Mm -hmm. If there are any questions now, we should open this up. But we could continue this as we often <laughs> have done. Uh, any any anyone who has anything you really want to ask, please put up your hand. I'm sure there are the microphone and things. Mm -hmm. Around, yes, uh, yeah. In on, your, uh, on the formal informal group, uh, you know, you had with other women authors, Nilima Sheikh, uh, Arpita Singh, well, and the uh, conversations <laughs> you had and the anxieties or concerns yeah. you were yeah. trying to explore together. Well, uh, I thought it was very important in the 80s that we do have a, a manifestation together because there were such fantastic artists at that time, women artists. And uh, thus far, uh, nothing of that nature had taken place. So I drew up a list of, I think it was 30 or 40 artists that I wrote to our, we used to write each other postcards. This was the cheapest means of communication and the fastest. And between capitals of the states, you could uh, it would reach in a day or two. It took a little while to reach Nilima, but Delhi reached very fast. So I wrote to Arpita saying, I've made this list. What do you think? <laughs> she wrote back, still have it. She wrote back saying, she was staying at that time at Tara Apartments in Alak Nanda. And she said, an owl has landed in my garden. I have called him Oscar. <laughs> and it follows me around holding my archer, thinking I'm his mother. And that's all she wrote. <laughs> <laughs> so she's telling me how absurd I am. <laughs> anyway, she thought for a while, she realized I, I must be really wondering why she wrote this. And she wrote back saying, Nalini, I think we should be four artists. And this is possible to do. And then she said, it's us, it's our generation. And I think I can persuade Swami to give us a show in Bhopal. And Ashish was kind enough to write our catalog. So we had a catalog. In those years, you can imagine, our catalogs were very precious. So that's what we did. And uh, 
and from Bhopal it started. But the thing is, as I said, uh, we were painting in watercolors because we, we carried this ourselves everywhere. We couldn't, uh, we, there was no way of sending it uh, by post or by uh, unaccompanied boxes. We took it as our luggage everywhere. And um, uh, so, as I said, you know, it, we had, to, I think I, and I think the others would also say the same, that we ricocheted ideas uh, with each other. And this was a very enriching experience. So between, uh, I think it was uh, 85 or 86 and 89, we had, uh, there was a moment when uh, a dear friend of ours said, ab bas karo. <laughs> bas <bod> ho gaya. <laughs> so, but we, I think even today, we, we would be very happy to have a show together. And I proposed, and they all said yes, yes. And all our daughters, we all have daughters. And uh, they are very, very encouraging. Say, we'll help you. Come on, you have to have a show together. <laughs> so, uh, well, I've always loved collaborations. And Anu, Anuradha Kapoor and I, we, we worked <coughs> on the job. And she's, of course, a full fledged director. And uh, uh, that was the time when we were able to do a lot of experimentation. Uh, in the Max Miller Bhavan, where we did our rehearsals, and then later at the NCCA, in the Experimental Theatre. I think that we extended our ideas together in a manner that uh, it did come together as a very uh, uh, dynamic uh, work uh, with uh, just one actor, Ritu Talwar. And uh, we used the Experimental uh, Theatre space like a, a, a fairground, like a mela, where uh, uh, people could walk around. And then there was a moment when an announcement was made that ab khel shuru hai, you know, so everybody would sit around and then watch the khel. So that's how we worked it out. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have a very good documentation of that, so not able to show. But that is when I first started using uh, these uh, cylinders. Mm -hmm. And they came down from the flies, at, uh, I think it was at 40 feet. And when they came down, uh, sorry. Uh, they cast shadows. And as we were not able to travel the work as we had wanted to do extensively in India, uh, well, I had to find the, the means to uh, continue with an idea of theater, but somehow work without the real actors. So I came to two forms. One was the shadow play, and one was the video play. So the video play, I could uh, shoot actors. Uh, and then uh, take them on a digital digital file, like I did Mother India, and there have been others. So this was a very, uh, it was another kind of theater for me, but it, it, it all got triggered off by the actual theatrical experiences through Medea and through the job. So the good thing about collaborations is that two people come with ideas with each, to each other, and a third possibility emerges, which is what is the exciting part. And also it collapses your ego, which is very good. And also the other thing that happened was, which was I think the most successful, was this film Duvidha, which was made by Mani Kaul. This was with that Bolex camera. With that Bolex camera, and all of us became his crew members, uh, uh, and we went to the site and he shot and everything. But this was the most successful uh, the, uh, product that came out of this uh, workshop. So you could make, you see the film was very, very expensive. So you could actually uh, 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 make an estimate for such a film uh, with a very, very low budget. But, and the quality was still very good. So, you know, and if this had continued, uh, it would have been uh, something quite uh, amazing. Now, it was a very important uh, program that Akbar set up. The only other one that I think that uh, wasn't as programmed is this one, but for me has been of vital importance is the Bhulabai Memorial Institute. If anybody were to ask me today, how do we make an art school, I would say go on the plan of the Bhulabai Memorial Institute. Completely an organic way of working and interdisciplinary because it also included music and dance. At that time, in I had yeah. people. I had a studio there since I was 
18 years old, the first year of uh, JJ School of Art. And Tayyab Gaitor De Hussain Al Kazi. Wasn't Satyad Dubey there for a bit? I was helping yeah. Dubey all the time. That was my first encounter with theatre backstage. Yeah. Yeah. I was making his postcards, I was helping him with uh, costumes. Wow. Yeah. So that was also my first encounter with young writers who were using myth to, you know, Suno Janme Jai, Evam Indrajit, all of these things had been written at that time and they were being performed on the mm. terrace of the Bulabai. Mm. Anyone else? Kiran, thank you very much, Akanksha and Soumya, who is always disappears from the scene, but she's a mover and shaker this time. Without her, things could not have happened. And without Akanksha, you know, we would not have been able to put up this show. And they have been absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much for this museum. Thank you that it's there. And uh, I think we are all very grateful to Kiran to have set up this museum. It's the only one in the country, by the way, <laughs> for, my, for me. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. <laughs>